let me just remind all of you, wilderness is where people ain't. I'm very comfortable with the results of Rare 2. I have often ex felt that the idea that if Peter is hurting you to shoot Paul in the foot is not a good strategy. I sure wish that you or somebody would communicate with the governors and let us know what your position is, yours. Well, good luck to you, governors. Uh, please address the... Uh, uh, please address the problem in real terms. Uh, remember that you'll be worrying about allocations a year from now, and two years from now, and five years from now, and ten years from now, unless we can uh, begin to harness the raw materials in this economy and bring them to bear upon these critical national problems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Governor. The people and politicians in the states west of the Rocky Mountains have never been fond of the Jimmy Carter presidency. It's a fact that in 1976, the president carried but one state in the west, Hawaii. And now, two and a half years later, his administration is no more popular here. The Western Governors Conference, held here in Sun Valley, Idaho, is an illustration of the degree to which the Carter administration has alienated the West. It's also an illustration of the work the president must do to put himself in a solid position for re-election in 1980. The 11 governors who met here, eight of them Democrats, criticized the administration for its handling of virtually every issue of importance to this region of the country. If it is too strong to characterize this conference as anti-administration, it is not too strong to say that a message was sent from here to Washington, a message of frustration from the West. I heard a cute story about the president that I want to tell you all. I just heard it since I've been here, as a matter of fact. Seems, seems as though the president was playing bridge one evening with Rosalind and two other friends. The bidding started, first person said, I bid a club. Second person said, I bid one heart. Third person said, I bid two clubs. Came around to Carter. He said, I bid four. They said, four what? Carter said, trust me. <laughs> Jack Watson's joke was one of the few laughs the Carter administration enjoyed during the 1979 Western Governors Conference. For the most part, the administration was on the defensive, trying to defend positions on a variety of Western issues affecting both the energy and the environment. Diesel fuel allocation was only one of those issues, but on the last day of the governors' meetings, the growing trucker blockades around the country and the presence of two Colorado independent truckers at the conference made the issue the dominant topic. It's important for you to understand that uh, in my meetings with the independent truckers, that their cause is just, and the strategy that they are now arguing with nationwide is one that I think today we can help determine. Because really working in the system and through the system and trying to put appropriate uh, ways to present one's case uh, to the political process and the political marketplace is very important. I think that it far, is far better than blocking truck stops or other forms that uh, some truckers are taking. Uh, these people, when I met with them, were not only measured and moderate, but also their demands seemed to me to be just. And in fact, you have agreed so, because in the resolutions that we've just passed, we have essentially uh, met uh, most of the requests that they had. They are people that are, uh, that are going broke in many instances. And like all of us, when we are faced with destruction of our economic livelihood, that they are searching for strategies to bring their case to the, to the, to the people. And I very much appreciate uh, your courtesy. Uh, Cliff Snyder uh, is an articulate and uh, able spokesman for the independent truckers and other organizations, uh, the convoy. And I would like to introduce him this time, at the same time thanking you for your indulgence. Cliff. Thank you, Governor Lamb. I appreciate uh, this opportunity to be able to speak to the governors of the Western Conference. First of all, I'd like to thank the governors for their time, patience, and efforts, and especially Governor Lamb for his 
interest in taking uh, it on his behalf to represent us. We, as independent owner operators of Colorado, are in a really bad predicament. And it's not only us in Colorado, but all over the country. Our problems are numerous and many. Too great to get in detail at this moment. But if something isn't done immediately, because we do haul 80% of the perishable products in this country, uh, the nation is going to be at a great loss. We need help, and we need it badly. Some of the problems we are faced with basically right now are fuel availability. It doesn't make much sense to load a load of perishable products when you can't get from point of loading to point of origin. Our second problem is a rising cost. In some cases in the last six months, the cost of diesel fuel has risen from 50 to 100 percent. There is a system by which we can get rate hikes, but with the bureaucrats involved and the length of which it takes, we can't afford to uh, wait 60 to 90 days. And second of all is the unification of minimum weight and length standards in this country. Without them, we can't haul the maximum load we can possibly haul in order to save fuel economy. And fuel and energy is one of the basic problems of this nation. And uh, without it, uh, we are only hurting ourselves and hurting the country. And once again, I would like to thank the governors and Governor Lamb and the people for allowing me this time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Steiner, I'd like to just ask a question because I received an emergency phone call from Governor Ray, who just returned to her state to handle some emergency matters, one of which is that they're just harvesting the perishable crop of cherries. And uh, this crop is usually shipped to the east. Uh, her concern is that uh, the, the independent truckers are blocking uh, the uh, service stations, the truck stops, and, and so her truckers can't load the cherries to ship it to the East Coast because your own people are blockading and stopping the trucking of that perishable crop. What is your answer in regards to that particular problem that's created for Governor Ray this morning? Well, Governor Evans, it doesn't make come, sense. Come up here. Like I stated earlier, it doesn't make much sense to load a load of perishable products in Washington and take them to the East Coast if the availability of fuel isn't there. And in this instance, when an independent trucker loads a load of perishable products and something happens in the process of transporting that, the shipper in the state of Washington doesn't hold the responsibility and neither does the, re uh, the consignee at the other end. The independent owner operator has to stand for that load. And when you're talking in essence of twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per load for a load of produce, that's a great responsibility. And we can't afford to take responsibilities like that. And if the availability of fuel is not there, there's no sense to, to even trying. I, I presume my question really is, is how soon are you going to stop the blockading of uh, truck stops uh, to stop your own people from hauling our perishable crops to market? And my answer to that is how soon do we get results on our problems? As soon as uh, some legislation is enacted by the federal government, I'm sure most of the owner operators would be more than happy to get back on the roads. But without it, we're go there's no sense to picking a load of perishable products up and hauling it to a customer if we're not making money at it. We just as soon sit and go broke as to load and go broke. But you're, you're really creating some dislocations to other other industries that are most seriously concerned and alarmed because they're going to lose their entire livelihood as a result of your blockade. Governor Evans, it, uh, you know, I can't speak for every single individual owner operator in this country. I do know the basic problems they have. But in reference again as to what I've said, there's not much sense to uh, going back out, back out on the highways and losing money. No businessman in his right mind is going to continue a business at a loss without some kind of help. We need help immediately. We don't need help 10 days from now, two weeks from now. We need it immediately. And the only one who can give it to us is the federal government. What? John, Governor, Governor Lamb. John, I think your point is very well taken. I, there's another uh, independent <coughs> trucker uh, here also that uh, would, would like to, at the, at the end of this meeting, uh, make a plea to independent truckers everywhere 
uh, to go back, not to blockade stations, to, to, to actually s to work within the system as we've allowed them to do here and not take up acts of violence or blockade. We don't advocate that, Governor. We, we, and, we feel if, you get, if they want to get their point across to turn the keys off and shut their rigs down, we don't advocate blocking fuel stations, violence of any type. That's not the way to get the point across. If they want to make a point, just let them shut it down. Just let them shut their rigs. There's a, we're, we're represented by almost 100,000 owner-operators in this country, and that would take a great effect on this country also. We do not advocate blockades of any type. But unfortunately, there are some owner-operators in this country and some people who do not like the point of sitting and waiting without some kind of action. It seems like it, it happened to us in 73 uh, that the, uh, nobody seemed to wanted to take interest. Everybody drugged their feet until it came to a point where we shut down and shut everybody down. And unfortunately, it, sometimes it does take drastic measures to acquire the attention needed to get the help we needed. And I'm not advocating blockades, violence of any type. I would advocate that they shut down on a nationwide basis. But we need the help immediately, sir. You know, one, one idea that, uh, that we had when we were stopping our blockade and the, the very responsible actions of these people, actually, this is uh, people that are desperate and are looking for a strategy, and we were able to offer them another strategy. Perhaps we could suggest to Governor Ray that she could take the resolution that we just passed about re-regulation of diesel and others, and with some of her independent truckers, go back and make their case to Washington. I have often ex felt that the idea that if Peter is hurting you to shoot Paul in the foot is not a good strategy. And I think that the idea that uh, blockades uh, or only the matter that they didn't have anywhere else to turn. And I would hope that maybe Governor Ray would, would, would recognize that the legitimacy of their claims. And as I say, I, I don't agree with them on the 55 mile an hour speed limit, but they haven't been asking for that in Colorado. But the basic elements about the fact that they're growing broke, they're in desperate straits, they lose money every trip rather than make money. And if she could find a non-disruptive uh, alternative, if the, their truckers are like ours, they will find them more than responsible. I think it's uh, extremely inequitable for the truckers to be faced with increased costs and not be able to pass this on. And I certainly would feel very comfortable without knowing more of the facts to, be, uh, to uh, propose that the Western Governors Conference take a position to ask the ICC to permit a pass on of the cost, uh, increased cost of fuel and make this automatic. Uh. And if that be the sense, uh, I would ask by unanimous consent that this uh, body go on record and proposing a resolution that the ICC <coughs> be asked to permit the truckers of this country to pass on the cost automatically as they can demonstrate the increase in cost. One thing I would like to make clear, I do sympathize with Governor Ray of Washington. We, we understand her problem better than anybody because we do haul the product. And we do know that they have a limited amount of time to get their product out into the market. But in the same recourse, I would like to make it clear that we have a problem and it, it needs to be taken care of. If we could open the doors through the ICC, have meetings with the ICC and some of the Congress, I don't know, like Barry Oshi, whether or not it's, uh, it's the ICC can do it by rule or whether you need a, um, whether the add-on has to be a congressional action. I do know that there is legislation pending in Congress now that does allow it, but whether ICC can do it on their own motion, I don't know. But I, I'm worried about those uh, well, I think cherries the in Washington we, and the crops. The biggest problem we have here is time. It's time. You know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a bind for time. The Governor's Conference did endorse an informal appeal to the Interstate Commerce Commission to allow truckers to hike their prices to offset fuel increases. Energy is the major issue in the West right now, and the Carter administration sent its number two energy man to explain policy and answer questions from the governors, a job that was not always easy. There is no credibility. We are fighting national credibility and inconsistent statements and no direct policy. Yeah, let me tell you about inconsistency in government. Government serves many masters, and you will know that from your experience uh, as a legislator and know it much more in the course of the next two years when you uh, will have to be the, the balancer and weigher. We're not at the point yet where we subordinate all national interest to energy by any means. We're at the point now where this country can still enjoy initiatives in the wilderness uh, arena. We can still set aside Alaskan lands uh, for uh, recreation and for future generations and at the same time meet our mineral requirements. Let me just tell you 
of some testimony that I gave in support of the D2 lands uh, legislation, the Utah, Utah uh, uh, amendments to that. I said that if you were at a point in our history where there were simply no more prospects left, then we'd have to look, the Department of Energy would have to look as those lands up there as being a most valuable resource, not for their wilderness values or the recreation values, but for their potential oil producing values. But we're by no means at that point, Governor. We have many years of a high level of exploratory activity ahead of us on the basis of available public lands and private lands, many years. And uh, consequently, we have the luxury of choice now. We can afford to say to ourselves, we will put uh, rare two lands aside. We will put D2 lands aside because at the moment we are not driven entirely by the energy equation. Now on the other hand, when we find that there are obstacles uh, that are unnecessary and serve no particular purpose. Now here I would think of, for example, uh, successive administrations have all regarded the moratorium on coal leasing on the public domain as unnecessary to serve uh, urgent national requirements. For the last three secretaries of the interior, it's been a major objective to unlock those lands which were locked up more or less accidentally in 1970 and remain so because of the uh, capacity of people who oppose any development of those lands to block any re-entry uh, into development in the courts. We don't see uh, at all the analog there. So I think that uh, uh, successive secretaries of the interior, uh, right down the line from uh, uh, Roger C.B. Morton to today's uh, incumbent, C. Sandris, uh, a man who knows the problems of this part of the world as, as, as well as any, have said to our, we've all said, we must go in and open those lands uh, for uh, development of, of, of coal. I don't really think that there's uh, been any conflict on, uh, in that area. You're talking about coal. I'm talking about geothermal in Oregon. Sure. Most of which is in our BLM or Forest Service land, which is being proposed to be locked up. What are we going to do about geothermal? Not coal now. What are we going to do about geothermal, which is a question. I sure wish that you or somebody would communicate with the governors and let us know what your position is, yours. Write a letter to me, to the other governors, because we are the ones that are talking to the people in our state. Governor, let you know our position on what? Uh, well, on this middle distillate, for example. On the middle distillate? On the middle distillate, if you care to look at the public record, you'll see repeated time and time and time again on my part, on the President's part, and on Secretary Schlesinger's, precisely the same points that I've just made to you. We will, as a primary matter, we're going from high middle distillate stocks, uh, or adequate middle distillate stocks, at the beginning of the fall. In the meantime, tilt towards middle distillate, and in the meantime, if you can add to overall runs, that's fine, and that will yield additional gasoline, and that would be very welcome, but tilt to middle distillate. That is was and will continue to be our policy at, with absolute clarity. And I'd be glad to, to, uh, uh, to provide that in writing for the governors if that would be useful. But I can't see how there can be any real misunderstanding of that, Governor, if your staffs have followed carefully uh, what's uh, come out of Washington. O'Leary came down hard in favor of nuclear power development, which drew support from Washington Governor Dixie Lee Ray. But she still criticized the administration for not doing enough. I'll try to make it brief. I agree with you, Jack, in what you said about nuclear power. It is an existing technology. It is proved. It makes electricity. It's environmentally benign. The accident record is excellent. And yet, we have a small but vocal anti-nuclear uh, group in this country that seem to have captured the minds and the hearts of great many people. If, in fact, the federal government believes, as I do, that nuclear power is a viable option, is the position of the Department of Energy, as you seem to have said, to have capitulated to these opponents? Or in fact, does the Department of Energy support nuclear power as a viable option? Uh, Governor, we support uh, wholeheartedly nuclear energy as a viable option. And we're doing uh, literally everything that we can think of uh, to restore it as a viable option for this economy. That includes the, uh, the bitter struggle to develop uh, and to take to the Congress a nuclear siting and licensing bill last year. It includes the long, hard work of the so-called IRG, or Interagency Review Group, looking at the development of a, a capacity to store, both for the short term and permanently, in geologic uh, repositories, the waste that are associated with the nuclear cycle. I have to tell you that as a part of that uh, capture of, the, of some elements of our system to that small vocal minority, 
you among your membership have a great deal to, to, uh, uh, to, of repair work to do. When, for example, we ask ourselves, is it desirable nationally to develop a capacity to store the waste that are associated not only with the military program, but with the commercial program as well, we find, yes, it is. And then we say, can we come to your state? And the answer almost uniformly is no. And I think that uh, so long as we begin to take the view that uh, at the national level and at the state level, that that minority uh, set of interests that look upon the uh, development of nuclear energy as a moral issue rather than simply as a physical uh, or uh, economic issue, so long as we permit that moral issue uh, to uh, dominate the discussion as it has over the last two to three years, that we're going to find ourselves increasingly frustrated in our efforts to bring on that uh, particular uh, source of energy. My own view is, as I've depicted it uh, to you here, I think that uh, uh, just as an analyst of this business, that the utility industry now has taken such a beating uh, from the standpoint of their investments uh, in nuclear energy that they are simply not going to invest any more. And uh, consequently, uh, regardless of what we do at the federal uh, and state level, until we can once again reassert uh, the uh, uh, a sufficiently high level of, uh, of optimism on the part of the utility industry that they can license, construct, and operate once constructed uh, those billion and a half or two billion dollar uh, plants, then I think uh, we're simply not going to be able to recoup that option. I think the country would benefit from a great deal more strong leadership from the federal government. Uh, there appears to be, and I'll have to say it again, equivocation on this issue that emanates uh, not only from the department from, but from the White House as well. Since those who understand nuclear power have a responsibility, I think, to provide some leadership and get the discussion out of the emotionalism and moral uh, issues and onto a factual basis, we would hope very much that the President and the administration and the Congress would provide more leadership. Energy is the preoccupation of the Western governors, but closely tied to the energy issue in the West is the management of public lands in the West. To many Western governors, the Carter administration's management of public land resources has been at best a policy of mismanagement or worse, an unwarranted lockup of resources through the wilderness process. Again, Washington Governor Dixie Lee Ray. No more wilderness. We have already given enough. Wilderness is preservation taken to the ultimate. Or to sum it up in a single phrase, which may be unfair, is certainly an oversimplification. Let me just remind all of you, wilderness is where people ain't. What does that do to us in the state of Washington? Our State Department of Natural Resources tells us that the additional, just the additional land recommended for further inclusion in wilderness in our state will cost us about 3,000 jobs directly in the timber and lumber industry alone. In our state, the ripple effect in this forest products industry is at least three to one. Many people believe it greater. We can at a minimum call it a cost of 10,000 jobs. It's not just timber that worries us in the state of Washington because our problems in timber are shared substantially by both Oregon and Idaho. But there are other things too. The wilderness areas impact and concern us with respect to water rights, reserve federal rights, and these are particularly pertinent in Colorado and Utah. Hard rock mining, Wyoming, Colorado, Nevada, Montana. Light mineral mining in the state of Washington. Oil drilling, Wyoming and Montana, and geothermal energy has already been referred to by Governor Tia. I would like those of you who are here representing the federal government to take a message to Washington, D.C. It is a simple one. Just remind the people who are there working for us, whose salaries we pay, that our nation is the United <coughs> States of America. United States. And the primary responsibility for managing affairs within the boundaries of states should be in the state hands. If the Resource Planning Act of 1975 set certain production levels for timber as being vital to the maintenance of our economic strength, why then has the administration under-budgeted the Forest Service to the point where 1980 production will be about 3.2 billion board feet below their goal? and all the time lagging in reforestation? 
At the same time, the administration proposals for wilderness are three million acres ahead of the goals that were set for the year 2020. Is it wise to be 40 years ahead of time on wilderness and 40 years behind on current production of timber or wise use of public lands? In closing, I'd like to point out that we have significant shortages in this nation. We have shortages of, of energy, shortages of jobs, shortages of capital, so shortages of natural resources, shortages of technological development and trade sur surpluses, and we don't have any shortage at all as a nation of wilderness. Let's look at Idaho as a case study. There are some maps it should be available here. I don't know. Al, where are the maps? Let's put them up. I think these two maps, better than anything I can say, will speak for the positive impact of Rare 2 uh, to the economic well-being of the Western states. Well, I see they're still rolled up. I can't quite believe that because three hours ago, I was assured these would be mounted and ready to be dis displayed on easels, but we'll do something here. These two maps indicate how the national forest lands in Idaho were in a holding pattern in a development moratorium prior to Rare 2, and how they've been allocated as a result of Rare 2. I think if you just hold them up, just hold them up. Don't tape them up. Just one guy hold, one guy hold one of those maps. And one guy. Can you hold this? Just turn it over. It's our state, you know, so I get to hold the map. That's very appropriate. If, if we can get both of these maps visible at the same time, the impressive demonstration that I think you'll be able to see very quickly is that pre-Rare 2, practically all of the national forest land in Idaho, or let's say a large percentage of it, was blue, meaning it was roadless, or blue or yellow, meaning it was wilderness or roadless area. All of that blue and yellow area was closed to timber harvest or any other uh, developmental activity. It had been identified as roadless and therefore was subject to uh, the land use planning process, administrative appeals, litigation, and basically when Se Secretary Berglund and I talked with uh, representatives of Boise Cascade and other forest products and interests uh, in, in February and March of 1977, this was the map they put on the wall and they said, Mr. Secretary, you've got to do something to relieve this supply problem because we are running out of material and we're being hassled by uh, many uh, interests that are preventing us from getting into the national forest system and the secretary and I said we'll do something about that and ladies and gentlemen this is what we did on your right you'll recognize that there's far less blue and yellow you'll recognize that there's a lot more dark green which is the non-wilderness output of rare two let me point out that prior to rare two there were eight million acres in limbo in the national forest in Idaho Seven million acres have been allocated, most of it to non-wilderness. Less than three quarters of a million acres are in further planning. And I think this is a demonstration of how Rare 2 did what it was intended to do. Thank you very much for holding up the maps. I'm sure your arms are tired. As far as I'm concerned, ladies and gentlemen, Rare 2 has served its purpose. Rare 2, as an executive branch project, is now wrapped up, and the product is on Capitol Hill. That should be of some reassurance to you. There was a time early in the drafting of the original Wilderness Act of 1964 when the thrust of that act was to continue to permit the executive branch to make wilderness decisions. Wayne Aspinall and uh, others involved in that process thought it would be more appropriate for what Chairman Jamie Whitten calls the People's Branch, the Congress, to resolve these issues. And so Congress has an affirmative role in establishing wilderness areas. And in this case, none of these areas we've proposed for wilderness will be wilderness until Congress says they are. Now, that means that the ball is in Congress's court. And uh, it's obvious that with uh, 15 and a half million acres of wilderness proposals uh, before them, 
involving several hundred areas across the country, many of them in the East, for essentially the first time. Congress cannot bite off all of that in one session of the Congress. So this omnibus bill that has been drafted by the administration but not introduced by anyone yet will be handled on a piecemeal basis. Uh, I would really like to understand what the purpose of wilderness is and if there are any guidelines being used in determining the matching of the purpose after you describe it. I don't uh, have any objection to uh, Governor Ray's definition. Wilderness is where people ain't. That's the bottom line. How do you include it as recreation then? If people can't really use it for recreation, how can you say wilderness is a recreation area? Well, don't mislead the media now, Governor, because it's open to all the public. If they can get out Only there if they on can foot. backpack. Or they can ride a horse, or they can float in a canoe or a raft. And uh, what's wrong with walking? Most of as, it can walk. As we know that from experience, that means about something less than 1% of the population. 1% of the population can walk? No, sir. Actually make use of wilderness areas for recreational purposes. I think that's their decision rather than their capability. Oh. Oh. Uh, May I? Now, Governor Rice said we're 40 years ahead on our wilderness allocation, but if we weren't, and we made a decision now to develop that wilderness, the generation that's in the driver's seat 40 years from now wouldn't have the option to set that wilderness aside. Remember when we were debating the dams in the Grand Canyon, Marble Gorge, Bridge Canyon, and folks said, what's wrong with putting dams in the Grand Canyon? Nobody uses it. No one floats the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. It'd be crazy to do so. And what's the situation today and for the past several years? That river is loaded to capacity and beyond with recreational users. Same thing has taken place in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, many other wilderness areas, and the same will be true of practically all of our wilderness areas 40 years from now. But we have to act today to designate wilderness areas. The option won't be open to us if we cut those areas down today. It won't be open 40 years from now. Well, Rupert, I, let me... Uh, a couple of issues, of course, that we looked at in Colorado. First of all, we recognize that 36% of our state is owned by the federal government, and that that's one could, could say that that's owned by 220 million Americans. You're running late on time. Rather than just two and a half million Coloradoans, and I think that your people have done an excellent job, and I would thank you for your cooperation. When you mention the overthrust, when you mention other areas of economic activity, that there was an awful lot of consideration and thought gone into drawing the lines by the Forest Service in our state to try to make sure that it did not or had minimal impact on economic activities in our state. And from our experience, it has been a very constructive one. It has removed from limbo, legal limbo, an awful lot of land that was uh, because not of your fault. This wasn't started by your administration. It goes back to court decisions in Congress. And I think people ought to remember that. And I think that it was a job well done. I feel very strongly that, you know, if you leave it to laissez-faire, we wouldn't have Yellowstone, we wouldn't have Glacier, we wouldn't have Redwoods, we wouldn't have Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, we wouldn't have Central Park in New York. It's, it's because there was some far-sighted people. And on a bipartisan basis, Congress, Republicans and Democrats, voted the Wilderness Act. And in our state, I think it has been well administered, and I thank you for it. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. I think I'm going to have to run uh, We've got a 1235 plane, and I still may catch it. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. The governors, at least privately, were less than enthusiastic about the second string Carter administration spokesman sent to talk to them about Western issues. And they were doubly upset about the length of the spokesman's stay. Rupert Cutler, for example, answered only three questions on Rare 2. Uh, we estimate that there were some 10,000 colts uh, born this spring, and uh, obviously they're doing tremendous damage to the, to the forage uh, in a good many areas and to the land resources and are certainly causing a reduction uh, in the domestic uh, livestock carrying capacities. 
uh, I think we all, uh, uh, most of us who have looked at it are aware that, that at the present time the herds are increasing at the rate of about 20% a year and uh, there seems to be no end in sight. And in fact, by 1982, there'll be some areas where it's estimated that the, that the uh, domestic livestock will be, uh, for all practical purposes, squeezed completely out unless something's done. I know that the Wild Horse and Burrow Act uh, places constraints on the methods of disposal, uh, but I also know that, that uh, in my judgment at least, something really tangible has to be done. Uh, because it's, uh, it's not only economically damaging to the farmers and those directly involved in the industry, but uh, to the country as a whole. We had a session earlier this morning on international trade, and, and all these things, of course, relate to that. Uh, the Adopt-A-Horse program that, that has been uh, tried has, has really been a miserable failure. There have been a couple thousand head that have been placed, and that's about it. I therefore ask you the question, uh, what policies uh, does the Department of Interior have? Uh, what long-range and short-range policies do we have for dealing with the wild horse problem? Um, I couldn't agree with you more that we've got a, that's, that's probably one of the toughest problems that I think the Bureau has and that the Department has. Um, and I was just, in fact, just uh, Thursday, I came, er I came early in Idaho back home and we were flying over some extensive rangelands in, in southern Idaho, and it was uh, amazing to me to see the number of, of young colts that had been born just this past year, and you had a fairly uh, rough winter uh, here in Idaho this last year. But I, I was amazed to see how they'd been proliferating on just, just one herd um, out in the, uh, in the southern part of the state, in the Oahe Desert. I don't know what the answer is. We, we haven't come up with one, frankly. Uh, the Adopt-A-Horse program hasn't worked, and as a matter of fact, it's my own perception that we're going to have more problems with the Adopt-A-Horse program in, in the foreseeable future. In fact, in the very near future, because particularly of the decision that came down in the federal courts in, in Oregon just a few weeks back, where we had a really, really tough prosecution uh, on some abuses that, uh, that, that some, of the wild horse, uh, some of the wild horses had suffered at the hands of folks that, uh, that adopted the program. And I think, frankly, that some of those abuses have been our fault also, um, because um, I don't think we did a, a good enough job, frankly, of, uh, of working with the folks who were adopting the horses to make sure that they understood what the limitations were. We've, we've spent, the Secretary has personally spent a great deal of time endless hours discussing this with Senator Jackson, who, as you know, was, was the original author of the legislation. And uh, both the Secretary and the Senator believe that we're going to have to get the legislation amended so that we will be able to dispose of title to the horses, unfettered. Unless we can do that, frankly, we don't see any way to manage it. Is there a is there an aggressive plan to pursue legislation of that sort? Or aggressive on the part of, of, of the department very much. I, I think um, Senator Jackson over this past year has been having some very extensive discussions with um, uh, the folks on the other side of the issue who uh, first came to him and uh, who were very concerned uh, that, that the animals be protected and be disposed of in a, in a humane way. And I think, uh, as far as the timing goes, that it's a matter of, of the Senator's continuing discussions, frankly, with, with those folks and um, um, helping him helping them understand what kind of problem we've got. And I, I think he's made some significant progress since the, since the first of the year on that. Well, speaking for, ne for Nevada, at least, uh, it certainly is our wish that, that the department itself place it up on the front burner and uh, turn it up on high. Well, if he, I, we will, and we have. It's, uh, like I said, the discussions have been going on personally between the secretary and the senator for a number of months now, st starting actually last fall. And uh, anything you can do uh, to, to help us in terms of some of the uh, horse protective associations in terms of, of, of getting them into the discussion and helping them to understand the problem would really be appreciated. I, I don't mean to, to prolong the discussion, but this 
in my mind, may be one of those kinds of issues where the department is not going to please both sides, okay. where you're just uh, going to have to uh, to bite the bullet and, and take some of these people head on in the interest of uh, what's best for the country. I agree. Another area that I've been very concerned with is the establishment of the endangered species, and many times this means plant species. And those of us that operate the land know that many plants will show up maybe every 10, 12, 15 years, and then they will just disappear from the scene. Well, I'm real concerned about some person that might not be as familiar with the plant life as those of us that operate on a day-to-day -day basis. After two or three years, he doesn't find any species of a particular plant and decided it was due to overgrazing and then we would really have a problem in trying to have the plant when it probably wouldn't grow if there wasn't any grazing at all. So some of these things we do have to be very concerned about. So I would say the balance again and certainly it's all in the interest of balancing in the best interest of the land. I have no quarrel with the fact that the Bureau of Land Management should have input into how we operate the lands, but certainly I feel those that have private lands in the area should have input. The state that has state commingled land should have input from the ownership of the land as well as the state should have input as a state. If there's a permanent controversy in the West, it's water policy. And the major water policy issue before the Western governors was a Carter administration bill that would require the states to match part of the federally funded water projects. The governors did issue a resolution favoring the concept of cost sharing, but that same resolution in no uncertain terms expressed opposition to the administration's bill. Utah's governor, Democrat Scott Matheson, perhaps the most expert of the Western governors on water matters, voiced the conference opposition. The National Governors Association has examined the matter of uh, cost sharing between states and the federal government with respect to water projects and we have unanimously adopted a position that a, an equitable cost-sharing arrangement is an appropriate public policy and we have adopted it. The particular cost-sharing legislation, however, which has been introduced by the administration, uh, does not meet the equitable requirements of the governors of the states and therefore, while retaining the support of a cost-sharing concept, we are opposing by this resolution the current bill. Uh, there are several uh, provisions in it that give us major concern, uh, one of which is that uh, in a trade-off for the cost-sharing at the state level, uh, the states were to have some management control over the process of selecting, planning, designing, and funding the projects uh, through the state administrative process and the legislature. That has not been addressed in the legislation, and governors and states need to have that flexibility plus that decision-making power if they're going to put their dollars in it. Uh, that is absent from the bill. One provision which is of great concern to most of us is the voluntary cost sharing for projects which have been approved and for which funds have been appropriated and are in the process of construction. And the administration bill allows states to come forward with a voluntary cost sharing arrangement and get in line ahead of anybody else if they have the bucks. Uh, that is probably uh, uh, a point of view that a state that has extra funds might be willing to support, but uh, most of the states that uh, are in the West are not going to be able to come forward with enough funding uh, to make that competitive. So uh, my judgment is that the uh, states with fewer uh, capital funding capabilities will be a great loser, and that will include, to some extent, projects which have already been authorized under previous legislation and, and uh, have been funded substantially uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, that being the case, I think the bill ought to be aborted for that reason alone. What this resolution does, in effect, is say we still support the concept of cost sharing, we will continue to monitor it, we will continue to design a way to get the job done, but this is not the bill that we are willing to support on this occasion. My personal preference for the interim is to work on a, uh, an ad hoc basis with the Secretary of the Interior on a case-by-case -case approach. 
And in my opinion, with that kind of experience, we can distill out in the next year uh, the process by which we can do it in a way the governors will accept it. And that's the basis of the resolution. And I move its adoption, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I'd like to second the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Pass. Alternative cost-sharing legislation has been drafted. The alternative measure would require a 25% cost share rather than the administration's proposed 10%. But the alternative legislation would give states a great deal more control of the projects, and the federal funds would be granted in block amounts to the states to utilize at their discretion. Despite the attractiveness of the control and block grant provisions of the proposal, Western governors are not all that enthused. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, the block grant approach for uh, states, uh, and that has served the, uh, I think, the country well. But this particular uh, proposal from uh, Moynihan and uh, one of the senators from New Mexico, in my judgment, uh, uh, is a complete violation of the integrity of the funding of water projects since the Reclamation Act was passed, I think, back in 1904. Uh, and there's a 25 percent uh, a requirement from the from the states in the block grant proposal and it covers all projects which are already uh, under construction and have received funding or at least partial funding to uh, to change public policy which has been uh, on the books and in operation for over 75 years and without any more study and investigation than that bill has indicated so far uh, to me is hardly the way to solve the problem the resolution did endorse the concept of cost sharing and most states uh, like your state in Idaho and others in the Intermountain West are gearing up developing funding sources uh, for their portion of that cost share but considering the fact that nothing's come from the administration thus far that would give uh, much more than 10 percent control and in the current administration bill not even that much of a federally funded project that would be that have its cost shared with uh, the various states what's the likelihood of regional and state alliances rather than federally funded projects that's something that uh, is in, uh, strictly in the realm of speculation in my judgment the governors have nationally approve the concept of equitable cost sharing and uh, we are in the process of searching for a, uh, a cost sharing proposal which will be uh, acceptable to the nation's governors in a diverse country. Uh, the administration bill in my judgment uh, does not uh, meet those needs and creates more problems than it solves. And my judgment is that uh, each state is willing to sit down on an interim basis and work administratively particularly with the current Secretary of the Interior who is a man of complete credibility and uh, we can I think develop practical ways to get the job done and I'd prefer to experiment for a year on that administrative level and then distill out of that and from exact experience a way to do it through legislation if necessary in my judgment that is a much more practical and reasonable way to go than to throw something uh, before the Congress uh, that, that just raises red flags every direction and this bill does and so, uh, although I support the concept, and in our state, uh, we, uh, we went with GO bonds for $25 million for water projects. So it is not that our state is not willing to come out and do its share, because we know our future is uh, tied into good water management. But for now, I would say that the states uh, are not ready, or regions are not ready, to come up with ways to solve it. In brief, what would you consider to be an equitable cost-sharing program? I think that uh, uh, some uh, small percentage of the costs, the vendables as the, as the administration's bill uh, uh, covers, uh, should be done. But basically, it's got to be on the basis of some kind of a partnership negotiation in terms of the planning and the design and the management of that project. Up to now, the federal government just says, hey, you put in 10 percent and we'll decide it. And so you've got to tack on the management piece and the cost piece and then you've got to also have the right over the process to assist in the management and the return of that payment. Finally, 
Well, you got to have a program that doesn't set aside and place into the cost-sharing formula projects which have already been approved and funded, partially funded. That, that was would one of the criticisms in the resolution. Yes, that would that would completely violate the integrity of public policy for all these years. And states have made their economic plans based upon that known quantity of policy. To change that and put us into a situation where we're scrambling, as a poor state scrambling with wealthy states for funds, would not be a pretty sight and we would be the losers. Energy, public land, and water resources comprise the foundation of the Western economy, and much of the conference discussion was devoted to those topics. Although the Carter administration has been criticized at this meeting for its management of land, water, and energy, the administration has initiated an economic program that seems tailor-made for the West, rural development. White House aide Jack Watson addressed the governors on that topic. As I talked to people in the government at the federal level, as I made these numerous site visits, spending two and three days at a time out in the field, talking to lots of county commissioners, or county judges, county supervisors as they're called, small town mayors, governors, others, we began to evolve a list of five or six priority areas that seemed to describe the major areas of difficulty, the major categorical areas in which we needed to address our attention. Without going into a lot of elaborate detail, the ones we identified at the threshold were rural and small town economic development, health, housing, water and sewer problems, Rural credit was a major one because credit money costs more in rural America than it does in the cities. You got to pay it back faster and you got to pay higher interest rates to get it in the first place. Rural energy was obviously one of the one of the ones we focused on. I will not belabor the subject because I don't think any governor here needs education on this fact, but to focus two or three points in our heads for this discussion, let me cite a few facts which describe the rural population. There are about 34% of the nation's population who live in rural and very, very small towns. Notwithstanding the 34% figure, about 52% of the nation's poverty is in those areas. All of the counties that are ranked in the lowest, that is to say the poorest economic percentile 20th percentile are rural, every one of them. Infant mortality rates are about 10% higher in rural areas than they are in the cities. Workers lose more days from work in rural America than they do in the cities. They are more subject to chronic disease. Despite those obvious and substantiatable health problems and disparities in small town and rural America, nevertheless, there is 44% fewer doctors in rural and small towns, 30% fewer dentists, 30% fewer nurses, so that there is this tremendous gap between health care need and demand for service and the availability and accessibility of the service, to say nothing of affordability. The governors generally appreciate the administration's efforts to develop a rural development policy, but during that meeting with Jack Watson, they were more concerned about the immediate interests, diesel fuel allocations, water policy, and land use. Conspicuous by his absence again this year from the Western Governors Conference was California Democrat Jerry Brown, the only man that so far has given any firm indication that he wants to challenge President Carter in 1980. The thinking was that Brown could have made a big splash at this conference if he would have shown up. His absence? Well, it was the fodder for some jokes, and it was also the impetus for some criticism of the California governor. To begin with, I think it's most unfortunate Jerry Brown made the decision not to come to Sun Valley and participate with, uh, with the other governors of the West. I think it weakens his position uh, politically. Uh, I think that if he'd been here, and if in the past years, if he'd associated himself with the West, Western governors, he could have built possibly a solid base of support uh, for his candidacy for the presidency. Uh, I fear uh, that's, uh, that's not occurring. Uh, he's uh, really not in held in very high esteem among the governors because we really don't know him very well. He, he attends the National Governors Association meetings uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's in and out regularly to get the appropriate press. Uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of an attitude. Uh, he'd be 
better off to be here and participate as the rest of us, even though their problems are very much different than our problems, uh, I think politically it'd be uh, wise. Obviously, uh, the governors of the West uh, really, uh, at this particular point, I don't think support him uh, in his try for the presidency's nomination. If Western governors couldn't score a first this year by getting Jerry Brown to come to one of their meetings, they did manage a first in their new chairman, the governor of American Samoa. Peter Coleman came from the South Pacific for the conference and went home the first ever territorial governor elected to chair one of these regional groups. 20 years ago, I came here to Sun Valley uh, as an appointed governor. And uh, it's fate that now today here in Sun Valley, I have been given the chairmanship of the governor's conference as the first elected governor of the territory of American Samoa. So the honor you have uh, given me really is a recognition of the governors and people of the territories of the United States. And uh, it's going to be difficult uh, walking the steps that John Evans had walked. And but I assure the, you, John, and all the governors, I will do my very best for you. Thank you very much. Jimmy Carter's Energy, Agriculture, Interior, and Transportation Secretaries were invited to this conference to talk to the West about its issues. For one reason or another, none of them came. The pinch hitters who did come were pummeled with tough questions and left after brief stays. The outgoing chairman of the Governor's Conference, Democrat John Evans of Idaho, was diplomatic in his assessment of the administration showing here. But Evans told producer Sid Sprecher, that there is still considerable trouble for Jimmy Carter in the West. Just how popular is Carter with the Democratic governors? Well, I, it's very difficult for any governor, governor to speak for any other governor, and I won't try to do that. Uh, we thought the administration was well represented. I thought they defended their positions rather well. Uh, there, they've been very controversial issues that we've been facing here in the West, in fact, in the whole country, and they're very difficult to, to resolve. Uh, but the Carter administration, I think, in the end result. Uh, once we, we resolve the energy issue, and I think it will be resolved for in the next two years, to at least have a moderation of the problems that we have today of shortages in gasoline and in diesel and electrical energy and etc. So I'm, I'm optimistic that the Carter administration will receive strong support from Western governors uh, in, uh, in Democratic Western governors in the nomination process at our convention. It seems fitting somehow that in this year when the Western governors found so little to be pleased about in the way the administration has been handling itself in the West, that they devoted one of their few resolutions of praise to a Westerner of considerable toughness and independence. All right, it's my pleasure to read the uh, the resolution in uh, memory of uh, John Wayne, the youth that's meant so much to so many of us. The Western Governors Assembly and Conference in Sun, Sun Valley joined together in expressing their deep sorrow at the death of John Wayne, who symbolized for all America and the world the particular spirit of our Western states. He had re resourcefulness, Family. courage, a sense of adventure, and integrity. The qualities which historically led to the development of the West and which were incorporated in John Wayne's art and character in full measure. He was a son of this region, and he embodied the spirit of this land for people everywhere. He will be missed throughout the world, but with special sadness here in the West because he was our own. His roots were deep in our soil. He was shaped by this land, and he helped to shape it. May his memory inspire us to cherish and promote the independence, integrity, strength, and generosity of spirit which were his and which he did so much to perpetuate through his work and the way he, and the way in which he lived his life. And thank you for that opportunity, and I think that that's a very fitting resolution. Thank you. The Democratic governors who occupy the state houses here in the West are in no mood 18 months before a presidential election to dump their president, Jimmy Carter, at least not dump him for the likes of a Jerry Brown. 
But they do dislike the administration for a variety of reasons. They feel alienated, cut off, out of touch with Washington. And they're also not sure that when they publicly criticize the administration for its handling of issues that are so important to this region, criticize them as they did this week, that it really does very much good. From the Western Governors Conference in Sun Valley, Idaho, I'm Mark Johnson.